And there we go. All right. Uh, the indie brain on free to play. Uh, it's pretty obvious that it's all about free to play. Um, after Cactus's talk, he was very, at least it seemed very bleak in the beginning. Um, if you don't hate money like, like he does, uh, this might be interesting to you. So, um, what will I talk about? The, the goal of my talk is to show you why and to a certain extent how free to play combined with the indie game can make something awesome. Yeah. But that's not all, I've got something special. I also have a theory that if you combine free to play with the designer's brain, you get something awesome as well. So the theory is that if you think about free to play as a designer, it will make you a better designer. All right, so that's a theory. All right, um, I'll start just a few words about me so you know why and uh, who's talking. Um, well, that's, that's awesome, but that's not quite me. I'm a little bit more of a nerd. Uh, all right, not quite as much. All right, that doesn't take it either. I guess the hat works. So um, me, I have a little bit of both in my, like in my DNA pool. I have a background as an indie games developer. In a sense, I've, I've, I come from the modding scene, like Quake 1, Quake 2, Quake 3. I've been doing this for a while. So the, my roots are very much in like small teams working for themselves, no, no money involved, just for the fun of it. But um, in the last two years, I've been working for uh, the corporate side. I've been kind of a suit. Uh, I worked for Gameforge, which is, which is a very, very big German company doing free-to-play stuff. I was a lead game designer and blah, blah, blah. I had a huge title on my business card. Um, so I have a little bit of both in me, which is why I'm, I, I'm going to talk about this. So um, I want to talk a little bit about what indie games, what I think indie games are and what I think free-to-play is, just so we have a baseline. Um, when I say indie games, that means you have full control over your IP, IP in a sense. Yeah, that means you do that thing you do, and you're independent of somebody else's control. Like you do the stuff you want to do, which usually involves, which is usually is a luxury you have because you have the money to do this. Um, and free to play is basically you get the game for free, and then you monetize the player by having them voluntarily spend various amounts of money for various. Um, different in-game benefits, whatever that may be. Um, so why should you even, if you're an indie game developer, why should you even start thinking about free-to-play? Because it's something, you know, it's a business model. That's an evil word. Um, so there's two big reasons, I think, why free-to-play is a very, very good thing for indies and like, games in general. One is the noobs, and the other one is the loots. Um, like, noobs means just free-to-play gives you a lot of players. That means since they don't have to pay money to try out your game, you'll have a lot more people looking into your game and just giving it a try. It's kind of the freeware thing uh, Cactus mentioned, uh, but it's, well, there's money involved, so you don't have to starve, I guess, I hope. Um, and that's awesome, especially if you have a multiplayer game that's really dependent on having a strong and vibrant and large community just to you know, a large body of players to be active in, free-to-play is a very good choice because you'll have, just have people playing. And loot means uh, money. And that's good for you too because it's awesome for your wallet. Um, it lets people spend as much as they want, which may be more than $60, which may be less than $60, but it can be very cool for you as a developer. And in the end, at least, well, I'd, I'd say isn't that what we all are here for, but it's probably not all of us. I'm here because I want to make awesome stuff that people play, like lots of people, the more the better, and I kind of want to make a living out of it. So I need both of that. I need lots of people playing, and I want some money. I don't want to be rich. I don't need the millions, but I wouldn't mind having Minecraft. All right, so uh, that's free-to-play, and I know there's a lot of criticism, like free-to-play is evil. <laughs> All right. Um, and there's, a, there's always the same, same point saying free-to-play is evil because it dumbs down the games, which it does so a lot of people get into the games and yeah, we're gonna maximize our conversion rate and get as many people in there and maximum CCUs and all these wonderful data-driven numbers you see. Um, and the other strong criticism I always hear is it also is very exploitative. Like you design your mechanisms to get the maximum amount of your players and you trick them into spending money and everything. 
Um, and yeah, there's some truth to that. There's a lot of games out there that do that. But that's kind of saying that makes free to play a bad thing is, I don't know, very short sighted. Because free to play is, it's kind of like the force, it's a tool, and it can be used for evil, but it can also be used for good. It, I think it all comes down to the, the attitude you have towards your players. Like, do you want to be fair? Do you think it's, it's a give and take? Or is, are, do they end up just being numbers to you? So free to play can be on the light side, if you want it to be. Um, I know there's also, you know, all right, I'll, I'll, I think I'll have to come to that later. There's a couple examples I have here about free to play games that I think are indie and are good examples of free to play. Uh, if you haven't played them, you should all play them because they're A, good games, and B, they monetize well, intelligently, and not unfairly. Um, one of them is Realm of the Mad God from Spry Fox. If you haven't tried it, it's on Steam. It doesn't cost you anything. It's free to play, so give it a shot. Um, it's a weird mix of an MMO bullet hell shooter RPG. I, it's very hard to define. There's no genre, no game I've seen that works like that. It does a lot of interesting things, and they, they, well, they're free to play and works. And they're from the awesome guys at Spry Fox. They get a lot of love from me because, because they're just, they, have, they have an awesome team. So that game is an example for like a PC downloadable title. It's out on Steam. Um, the other game, also Spry Fox, is Triple Town. This is a social game. It's a Facebook game. Uh, again, a very, very good game. It's an interesting game. It monetizes well. It doesn't feel unfair. Um, again, it doesn't cost you anything, so give it a try. And the last one is an example for a mobile game. This is Tiny Tower, uh, often cloned nowadays because it's been so successful. Uh, another neat little game, they do a lot of things right. I think they do a couple things wrong, but everybody does. Not that I wouldn't be doing any mistakes. So these are, I believe, just a few examples of indie games and free-to-play working together to create something awesome. Um, so with like that kind of the introduction, why it's awesome and why we should all do it and everything, uh, now I'll try and talk a little bit about the how, is it like about how to actually go about it. And it all boils, basically, if you want to make free-to-play, you'll have to think free-to-play. It's, it's, not, it's not a magic skill set and you have to you know, go to school two years to learn that. A lot of that is common sense in a way, but you'll have to kind of get into the mindset. Uh, you'll have to think about your games as more than your games. When I say that, I mean, um, you have to have the idea of money in mind as you make the game. And I know Cactus said a lot about it's a bad thing and it ruins creativity and everything, and that can be true. But an, a counter example I'd like to propose is, um, have you guys played Space Invaders? That is a pretty awesome game, right? We love Space Invaders, don't we? Give it up for Space Invaders, guys. <laughs> awesome. At least some of you are still awake. So Space Invaders is pretty awesome, but Space Invaders was designed thinking of money. It's an arcade game, and it's terribly hard and unforgiving, so you can make money and pour in quarters. So they designed the game thinking about money, and that does not make the game bad. That just makes the game different. And I don't think that, I think that's a very good argument against um, saying money, thinking about money makes the game bad by, def by default. It can make your game crappy, but so can anything else. All right, so um, think about free to play, you should, you should start thinking about free-to-play when you design your game. It's very difficult to slap it on later. There's been successful examples in the MMO space where they managed to go from a subscription model to, an, uh, to a free-to-play model and get breathe new life into the games. But generally, the earlier you, you think about it, the better it works. Um, so here's a few things you should be on the lookout for. Um, one very, very important thing is the game start. When people start your game, you'll have to convince them. Because on the one hand, it's, it's free, so they'll be there and they'll look at it. But if it's, if it's not convincing, if it's not awesome in the first five minutes, you'll lose them. And since they didn't pay anything, there's no investment on their part, it'll make them leave much sooner. Like, they give it a try, it's crappy, then they leave. Especially if they didn't have to download or install anything, which is kind of what you want to do because it makes people play the game much more. So, be very careful about your game start, and when I say game start, I mean everything leading up to the game. Like looking at the 
game as a whole experience. Like, where, what's the website around the product? Where do the players find the product? If we're on Steam, what kind of screenshots do we have? What kind of text do we have? And trying to make it as cool for people. If they see it, they say, all right, I'll give it a try. I'll give it a shot. Because you usually don't have a very big marketing budget as an indie, so you'll have to try and fine tune that as much as you can. Um, yeah, people just don't have patience to anymore to wait for something getting awesome two hours in. All right. Uh, next thing you'll have to think about is product design. This is another one of these things that seems very, very evil. Like, oh God, we have to think about product, and that's you know exploiting people. But the, the idea here is how can I make the stuff I want people to you know pull up money for be awesome without being crappy to everybody who doesn't spend money. It's a balancing problem, especially if you have a competitive game, you get into you know, big trouble. Um, there's a lot of talk about how to design your products and everything. I held talks on that. Like, there's, I, at least I designed or did, came up with four basic cate categories of products. There's as, uh, advantages, which make you better at the game. Um, and these are just, they work. People want to sell them, but the Dangerous, be careful when you use them. There's aesthetics, which are stuff that looks cool and just sets you apart. Uh, but what works really well and usually doesn't affect game balance. Uh, we've got comfort, which is, it makes the game easier for you. In a, not in, in the sense that suddenly I have more hit points or anything, but I have, like, I get special access to an auction house filter or whatever. It's kind of, you have to be very careful with that because you don't want to design a shitty interface and just so you can tell a good interface, because a shitter interface ruins a game. So that's something I think a lot of people tend to want to make, because it's easy. And then the last thing you can easily sell is content, like just more stuff. Because if people like your game, they want more of it. Um, but that also means you need to know your audience and what they most likely want. Um, it usually helps if you do some data mining there. Yes, another evil word. We do data mining and data-driven design and everything. It's a matter of balance. Don't overdo it. Don't go just by numbers and have your players be numbers. But if you know what your people, your players like, you can listen to them on your forums or whatever. You can try and give them more of that. All right. Uh, and then there's monetization design, which means the pricing. Um, pricing is a very, very fragile thing. Um, where's my notes on that? All right, I have no notes on that, excellent. Um, if you want to make your prices, you will have to, you know, you, it's not just prices in your game, it's the prices compared, it's always a price range and a continuum. Like within your game, you have to look that you always offer something for everybody and outside of your game, like there's people playing other games, like especially on like social platforms where people play multiple games. So they compare your game to their prices and they kind of, you're, you're not, you're, you're not your own market, you're within a larger market. So there's a lot of different things. There's, there's a whole field of behavioral economics that you can go look into, that's kind of how people make economic decisions. There's a lot of cool books on that and kind of goes back into game design because if you spend gold in a shop and not money, uh, the same factors come into play. But it's something you need to be very, very careful about. We, if, if you guys remember the shit, shit storm Eve had about the $100 monocle, anybody? All right. Do you want me to explain? All right, I'll do. Um, so Eve uh, added a free-to-play market for vanity items. That means cute little stuff and awesome hats, I guess. I like awesome hats. Um, and they only brought in items that were very, very expensive. And everybody was all up in arms about that. They had, they had virtual demonstration, which I found was pretty, pretty awesome. Just players hogging a server and demonstra demonst demonstrating? Is that the verb? Um, but the problem with them, with that was not that they offered awesome stuff, because people were, they, they were thirsty for you know, representing the characters and cool stuff, but the, they only had an expensive price range, and people just felt cheated. So, you know, there's people that have a lot of money and want to spend a lot of money and want to show off their status, and that's cool for them and that's cool for you, but there's people who don't have a lot of money who also want to look cool. So there's a lot of stuff you have to think about here. Just pointing it out, it's very fragile. And then the last thing, um, usually free-to-play games, people don't spend money at the beginning of the game, but after a while. That means after they've been playing for a while. That means you want your players to stick with your game for a while. 
Uh, that kind of brings us to the games as service model and everything. But to get your players to stay playing, you need to give them stuff. And I don't mean more products in your shop that they have to sell, but more content. That means you have little events, you have little championships, you give, like, all right, we have, it's Easter, so we do a little Easter event that gives people something to play about. So that there's kind of something happening in the game and in the game community that gets people to stick around and like the game. And you can make a lot of money with content uh, refreshes and events and selling you know, Santa hats for Christmas and stuff like that. But that's not the point. Like, you want people to stay and you want to update and kind of have, have something for people to, to stick with the game for a while. All right. Um, so I'm pretty much at the end of my talk. I'm not sure how good I am on time. Let me look at the watch. All right, I'm pretty good. So um, now the takeaway I want you guys to think about is that if you have the right mindset, you can have something pretty awesome if you manage to do free to play. But that just means more players and more money. And that's, that's just a win-win for everybody involved. Now, about my theory that I mentioned in the beginning, so how does this make you a better designer? Um, if you think about free to play, there's a couple things you think about that are really applicable to games in general. Like, you think about how to make your game start as good as possible. That's a really good thing. Um, you think about psychology, like what do my players want? What can I give them that they like so they'll spend money? But you want to give them what they want, what they like, because otherwise they wouldn't spend any money. Um, it'll make you refresh the game and bring updates and get people to stay with the game. And that's just that's a couple things that I think really help. So that's the theory. Anybody disagree? That's the end of the talk, and it's kind of Q and A. So. And yeah, if you disagree, feel free to come up and yell, yell bullshit. I kind of like that one. Um, we have around uh, seven minutes of Q&A. So if you want to have to get something in or get something additional out, please shoot. All right, I just rocked your socks and you're all blown away. <laughs> Excellent. No. Thanks. I, I did a lot of time searching. Yeah? You can buy spaces that free to play but not necessarily do or sell. Yeah. I would say that there are some companies, <coughs> we offer something, who maybe go a little too far in the mind of sales and other aspects and modify the game or whatever. I totally agree. I don't think Stinga is among the worst. Like, if you look at, uh, in the direction of Asia, they, well, it works for Asia because they have a different mindset and how they, what kind of stuff they want. But looking out there from Europe, they do really tough monetization. Like, they, it's a vice. Uh, and I think Zynga is, when it comes to monetization, it's all right. It's not really, really bad. What's really, really bad is the spamming. Kind of, it needs, it, it's not either you pay or you can earn it by playing. It's either you pay or you annoy your friends. And that's kind of what I don't like about their monetization scheme. You kind of have to pay to not be a dick. And that's, I don't know. It's not cool. Any other questions? All right, if anybody has any questions but is too shy to come up here, uh, I'm around and you can spot me, I have a hat. <laughs> All right, Anjin. I have a question. Yes. Um, All right, free-to-play is a game of scale. A lot of people will not spend money. There's a lot of ARPU and RPPU, KPI data and everything. So in average, I think, depending on the kind of game, the more hardcore your game is, the more people spend money. But it ranges from like 1% to 2% for social games to like almost 20% for hardcore MMOs. Uh, that's uh, the percentage of people that p spend money, and they don't spend money every month. So you need a certain number of players to, that it 
to have a significant revenue stream. But that doesn't have to, if you're a small company, if you're like three people, you, that doesn't need to be huge. And there's a lot of, like, especially in Germany, a lot of little companies, that are like four, five, six people maybe, that make browser games. Like they did one browser game that was successful, like the Supremacy 1914 guys. Anybody played that? Probably not. No? It's a nice little browser game. And I think they're in Germany, and they were pr very pretty successful. They got, a, they got some awards or something. So, sorry, don't have that in mind. But they managed to have free-to-play in their small team. It's just a question of scale. Like if you're a 400-people company, like, like Gameforge or Bitcoin or whatever, they need large numbers to sustain their, their employees. But if you're five people, you can work with less. As for single player, the thing, as I mentioned earlier, with free-to-play is um, people don't, usually don't spend money from the get-go. That, that some people do, but most don't. So you want people to stick with it for a while. And multiplayer just has a longer lifespan as a single player. Um, the, other, the only model I can see for single player would be selling content. Um, and that's basically DLC. You have a freeware game with DLC at that point, which is slightly different. Yeah, just to answer the question. All right. Yes, but just a second. The guy in the back was first. Hey. Um, yeah, how do you, do you personally go through the problem that um, you think when you have too many players, that you want to play one game and play it just to buy stuff as much as you can and keep your money coming into it? But if you allow to buy a game from it any time, you obviously have a balancing problem with the gameplay. Um, not everything you sell affects the game balance, and yeah, yeah, yeah. But the stuff you, the stuff that affects the game balance, you should. There's no blank, you know, statement that works for every game. Every game is different. If I have a very competitive game, I'd actually re restrict it. Like I have to say, all right, you have to have a certain level or something to get that kind of item. That's, it's a, it boils down to your attitude towards the game and your players. Uh, as, but in a very fragile game, I'd be very careful. And in general, I try and make that stuff available for non-players as well, like, and non-payers. Like, you, you play a while and you, you know, amass some kind of currency and you can buy the stuff, or you can just buy it directly for money. Because then it doesn't really ruin game balance that much. All right, you had a question? No, he was first. Yeah. All right. Um, that's all right. Now, now, now I'm going to sound bad, but I think they give away too much free currency. Because every floor you build, you get one tiny tower buck, and there's not enough awesome stuff to spend it on. And I, I played for a while and have like 80 tower bucks left, and I don't spend them because there's nothing to spend them on for me. Um, and one feature really I, I'd love to have that I'd spend the tower bucks for is to when I build a new floor. I'd love to select what kind of building I get there, which I don't. So I, it's always random. And there's a, I think they could have they could have done a little bit more. They could have pulled, you know, made tower bucks a little more desirable because they just you have too much of them. That kind of devalues the value of your currency, and given a lot more, a, a couple more, like just options from, for for monetization. Well, they do more. They do the power up for the elevator. They do um, refill your apartments, which is the only thing that I really use. They allow you to upgrade your uh, your your uh, places, which doesn't really feel like it's upgrading. Like that, it, that, there's not enough feedback for it to feel awesome enough. Um, and they allow you to instantly finish your building stuff, which is kind of taking away what the what the game is. Like if you're in a hurry, alright, but usually I don't mind. But but that's yeah yeah yeah. I'm not saying it's a, I'm saying it's a good game. I'm just saying I would have done a couple of things different, and that's personal opinion. But having too much stuff that is a question of interface, and that's something you can solve. At, at a certain point, if you have thousands of items, it'd be very difficult. But I think you could. That's a problem that can be solved. All right. Anybody else? Oh, right, you.
I think but then the game's basically like a trial and you unlock the full game right. yeah um, I it, that's basically the difference between a hard paywall and a soft paywall like and I do prefer the soft approach because it allows people who don't have money to play the game for longer otherwise they play to it for a while and then oh, now he's extorting me that doesn't feel good to me as a player. I've made some progress and suddenly they say, no, you're gone. Spend some money up front. If they're upfront about that and they tell me from the beginning, all right, you can play for 30 minutes and then we want your cash. That's fine. Then I can play for 30 minutes and then decide. But if they don't, that kind of, eh, it's a dick move. Mm -hmm. All right, that was it. Thank you very much for marketing. Thanks.